Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our Reporter Night series at Columbia University. My name is Steve Cohen, and I'm the Senior Vice Dean of Columbia's School of Professional Studies and Director of the Earth Institute's Masters of Sustainability Management Program, and I'm also a Professor of Practice uh, at the School of International and Public Affairs. I'd once again like to first thank our very own professor at the School of International and Public Affairs uh, and distinguished science writer for the New York Times, Claudia Dreyfus, for putting this virtual event together for Columbia students and faculty, as well as the general public. Claudia is also a lecturer in the Sustainability Management Program with the School of Professional Studies at Columbia and its Earth Institute. She teaches a wonderful course called Writing About Global Science for the International Media. Today, Claudia will be interviewing the media columnist for the Washington Post, Margaret Sullivan. Margaret Sullivan has an extensive background in journalism and media as the former editor of the Buffalo News and former public editor at the New York Times. This evening, she'll be applying her expertise with Claudia to discuss how the media has covered the biggest science story of the century and explore the ways in which pandemic coverage has been both a resource and disservice to the public good. We're very excited to have Margaret Sullivan at Columbia tonight, and we're looking forward to learning her perspective on this topic. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Claudia. And thank you to the School of Professional Studies staff who made this series possible. You know, to say that in the world of journalism, Margaret Sullivan is a legend, it's, I know it's a bit of a cliche, but it's true. Miss Sullivan started her journalistic life as an intern at the Buffalo News, and she worked her way up to being the, the top editor. She did that uh, in, she worked in Buffalo for 20 years and then came to the New York Times where she was the public editor, which is something like being a bioethicist, but for journalism. And she was so good at it and so skilled that even when she criticized many people, she did it with such grace and with such elegance and such intelligence that nobody was particularly offended, I, I think. Uh, we all learned from her. And now at the Washington Post, where she does a media column, we're learning more from her. Um, right now, well, she came to the Washington Post four years ago, right at the beginning of the ascendancy of the, the Trump administration, and she's, she's had a lot to cover. She's just published this book, which is called Ghosting the News. It's about local journalism and the crisis that the death of many local venues has, has brought. And it's just out from a branch of Columbia University Press, Columbia uh, World Press. Um, and we're really pleased to have her with us tonight. Welcome, Margaret Sullivan. Uh, let me give you the correct title before we begin of her book. It's Ghosting the News local journalism and the crisis in American democracy. So Margaret Sullivan, welcome to Columbia School of Professional Studies. You're the right person to ask these questions. Like the most basic question, how do you think the press has been doing in what is probably the most important story in science since the beginning of the atomic age? Well, uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Claudia and Steve for welcoming me to this class and to your live stream. Um, it's a real honor to be able to, to talk about this and it's really important too. Um, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you finish your question? To, did, or were well, you... the question is how, how is the press doing in this yeah. crisis? So, so one of the issues and problems that I have when I'm talking about the media, which I do because my title is media columnist for the Washington Post, is that it, the word, the term, the media covers a lot of ground. Um, you know, are we, when we say the media, are we talking about cable news? Um, are we talking about the New York Times or Breitbart or, um, you know, 
all things in between, or are we talking about local news organizations, local newspapers? So um, it's very it's very tough to sort of um, give a grade that would cover all of those um, all of those entities. So I guess I'd like to break it down just a little bit, if I may. Um, Please do. I, I think that the big national news organizations, the Times, the Washington Post, um, and others, including the network news, for the most part, have done a pretty good job on this. Um, you know, taken it very seriously, given it a lot of ink or uh, bites and airtime, and um, you know, you couldn't really fail to understand what was going on if you were tuned into or reading those outlets or those publications. Um, on the contrary, you know, at the other side of things, I think that um, some of the most conservative or pro-Trump um, news organizations, particularly Fox News, which is so dominant and so powerful, um, have done a, a spotty at best and probably better described as poor job of covering this huge story and huge pandemic, particularly at the beginning. Um, many of those pro-Trump and conservative news organizations downplayed the importance of the pandemic and probably contributed to two different things. One, that the public was able to kind of dismiss it um, oh, it's not that important. This is a this is a figment of the elite me elite media and politicians who don't like our president or who hate America, or something like that. Um, and also because Fox, in particular, is so influential with the president himself, and you know the the sort of the big stars of Fox News like Sean Hannity and others. Laura Ingram are able to, in their broadcasts, actually, you know, affect public policy because there's this kind of feedback loop between the president and what he hears on Fox News, as ridiculous as that may seem, because that really shouldn't be his source of information when he's got, you know, the entire globe of experts to call upon. But nevertheless, that is what happened. Um, so, and then there's kind of a bunch of things in the middle, and that's where I would put my particular um, area of interest right now, which is local journalism. So this encompasses local newspapers, a lot of websites, uh, you know, digital startups, um, public radio. And I think in general, they've done a good job, but it could be better. So that's a little bit of an overview. Well, you've written your new book about the death of small community newspapers and what it means. Where does that intersect with the lack of full-scale understanding in our society of what this pa pandemic means? So, you know, just to provide a couple of top-line numbers for, for students and others who might be listening, this is really a big problem. And, but it's not a well understood problem. Yeah. So since 2004, more than 2000 newspapers, local newspapers have gone out of business. Some of those are weeklies that are small and some of them are fairly substantial regional dailies. And um, so that means that there are many communities around the United States that can be described as news deserts, which um, means that essentially there isn't a lot of local news there, um, or maybe not any in some cases. So it's certainly, and, and then the other factor is that people trust local news more. They, they may very well not trust what they're hearing from the national media because, you know, it's so-called fake news or it's biased, but they do tend to trust their local outlets. But when those local outlets go away, um, you know, the sort of overall base of understanding that a whole group of people in a region can share together sort of diminishes in a very harmful way. And we're seeing that happen before our eyes. Um, so what it means is that, okay, if you happen to get the New York Times or 
you know, really be a news junkie and be following these things carefully, you might be well informed. But if you're relying on sort of the news that comes to you in your community, you might actually not at all know what's happening. Um, I mean, of course, you're going to know what's happening nationally in some broad way. But you might not know, for example, about the hospitalization rate in your area, whether the you know, whether people are, you know, what the state of the, of the county's reopening is, how it's affecting people in the area, all these sort of things that have a very specific local uh, angle, you might be much more unaware of those than you would have been 10 or 15 years ago. Well, I'm wondering also if some of the problem with coverage of the pandemic has to do with the un unprecedented nature of the pandemic. Uh, in terms of national media, the Times, the Washington Post, to a great degree, the wire service, the AP, they've been very good on publishing information that people need and, and covering this in a sustainable way. But all of them have had uh, science reporters working there long term. Most newspapers don't, and most television stations don't. Um, and so a lot of the early part of the pandemic, it seemed to me, was covered by political reporters who in general didn't know that much science. Was, do you think that's part of the problem? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, because the pandemic in the United States quickly and elsewhere quickly became a political story as well as a science story. Um, and because it involved the president and governors and so on, yeah. very often the people who were covering it were not experts in science or disease. And, um, you know, they were sort of covering the politics of it as opposed to the science of it. So I do think that that, especially early on, you know, yeah. really created a problem. And you know, frankly, the messages that that were being put out by our national politicians were were confusing as well. You, I'm sure, all remember that early on there was this whole question of, oh, well, should people wear masks or not? Well, maybe. You know, even Doctor, you know, the sainted Doctor Fauci um, was somewhat wishy-washy on that. Um, now, much much firmer. But you know, I didn't see the news media really um, bearing down on that and doing a lot of reporting from other countries where mask wearing had become um, the norm and was being was very effective. Well, in the past, when reporters didn't understand the hard science of a particular story, they could go to trusted sources who could explain it to them, or they could go to political leaders who uh, would say, well, we, we all have to pull together. This is a crisis. This is an emergency. And uh, the political leaders would uh, tell you a lot. But well, what do you do when the trusted source or the political leader like the president is not a reliable source of information? Did, uh, I hate to use the phrase mainstream media, but did the major media uh, rely too much on trusting the, for, the powers that be in Washington on this? You know, I'm not sure about trusting, but certainly magnifying and amplifying what was being said in a way that wasn't always sufficiently skeptical. Yeah. Do so you think that, I'm when, sorry. When, you know, when, yeah. for example, um, you know, the president's now infamous um, talking about hydrochloroquine as a possible cure, which I mean, is still being talked about by some, um, you know, this was reported as sort of, well, isn't this an interesting thing that the president has said, um, as opposed to this has no basis in fact, and is, a, is craziness. Do you, you know, think the president's daily uh, news conferences, now that he's back to doing them on, on the pandemic, should be covered? I think they should be covered, but I, I've been saying for some time that I don't think they should be taken live because um, if you broadcast them live, 
there's not much chance to provide context, to provide fact checking, and to kind of um, uh, ameliorate the amount of misinformation that's being sort of spewed out there. So I think that you know one way to sort of minimize the misinformation is to is to take a few you know even if it's on a sort of delay and do a little fact checking so that you could kind of present that as part of what people are seeing. And you know when I I've written that and sometimes people yes. say oh you know you're you're trying to censor the president that's terrible. I I don't feel that way at all. I you know fine tell people what he said broadcast it show it but um, don't unnecessarily magnify it and present it as fact. Well, a lot of it is in fact, and, and I mean, many medical organizations had to advise the public not to take uh, Clorox internally. Um, and it wasn't really until that moment that you saw uh, at least visible signs that the White House press corps was gonna be more skeptical of what was what was being said but that's because everybody knows that it's probably not a good thing to take Clorox internally yeah plus we've had the chance we've had at, at that point we had the chance to see the comedian Sarah Cooper and see what she had to say about it which was the greatest thing ever what did uh, she have to say oh I mean she's a hilarious mimic of uh, a lip syncer of the president and her her piece about what he said about bleach and disinfectant is definitely worth finding. I imagine many of your students have already seen it, but I commend it to all of you. Um, uh, was there a turning point when people started getting more skeptical and, uh, of just the science information? Uh, well, I mean, I think that as people started, you know, sometimes this comes home rather immediately. And as people started seeing their friends and neighbors get sick and sometimes die, um, the message started to sink in a little bit more meaningfully. But I do think that in terms of the media being more skeptical, that moment we were just talking about with the bleach and the disinfectant and hydrochloroquine as a cure um, was a particularly, it was a, it was a turning point. I mean, if you remember early on, and this was, I guess, in February, the president was still saying at every opportunity, this is, don't worry about it. It's going to disappear. There's only- Like magic, he said. Yeah, it's gonna go away. It's going to disappear. Um, we've got it under control. And clearly now 140,000 people have died in the United States and it's not under control at all. So that has been, a, I think, kind of a, a slow awakening. Do you worry at all about the coverage of vaccine development and, uh, and, and drug development? Uh, it, it seems to me to be very optimistic and, and perhaps wishful thinking. I mean, people really want good news we, on this. We all do because a, a good vaccine could get us to leave the house, which would be nice. Uh, uh, and until then... <laughs> We're stuck sending out for dinner. Yes, I do think that it's been a little too rosy. Um, we don't know whether these vaccines that are being discussed will be effective. I mean, we can hope that they are. Um, it, you know, every time there's news of something, it does seem to get sort of blown out of proportion. Um, and then, you know, for political reasons, um, various politicians who may be up for re-election, for example, um, may be, uh, you know, trying to present a rosier picture and so overblowing the, the, the likelihood that this is actually going to happen. And yes, I agree, we all want it to happen. Nobody's wishing that it, it nobody I don't think is, is wishing that for political or other reasons that this goes on one more moment than it has to. Do you think this experience, if it's short lived, will change the way we feel about science coverage and, and uh, just science information? I, I think the real problem, perhaps, that why the public sometimes, or elements of the public, were so susceptible to uh, doubt and not understanding what was going on. And people haven't fully pulled together on this. I mean, you, 
you see people in the street not distancing. You, you see a lot of people not wearing masks. Um, if, is it that they really don't accept the expertise of scientists? And um, what is wrong with our education system that people have not gotten that science is a, a process that, that's more reliable perhaps than many? Well, you know, I think that if people were ready to turn the corner on science as a important, you know, part of our education that we should be paying very close attention to, we would, ha we as a society would be taking climate change more seriously too. But it's, it, there's a real parallel there. Yeah. Um, we just don't want, at some level, we just don't want to believe it. With COVID-19, we are being forced to believe it because people are dying in front of our faces. And um, it, and climate change obviously has immediate effects too, but I guess maybe they're a little easier to ignore. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not particularly hopeful that the public generally is going to turn the corner on this. I mean, I'd like to say that I am, but I mean, I do think that more people are aware of how our government agencies work and how they're made up and what the CDC is. And um, there's a little bit more understanding of that, but I, I don't know that the public in general is going to be more science oriented. And I agree with you, Claudia, that a lot of it comes down to, um, you know, probably elementary school education. And certainly uh, university education, I mean, a large segment of the public has gone to college. I, and yet, because perhaps uh, so much of the science education is aimed at either creating uh, physicians or, uh, or researchers, all those people who've had to take basic biology are not really quite on board because th those courses did not speak to them. So I personally hope that this crisis creates some change in how we teach biology because we all need to know it. And we all need to know our science, if I may be, get preachy, so that we can be good citizens because a lot of these decisions are involve understanding this and not leaving it to others. Let's go to the students in the class because they have some really good questions for you. Uh, uh, students, hey, hi, are you back? Are you in the virtual room at the moment? Hi. Um, let's hear from Sarah Hussein, who is a student in class and also works at Columbia. Sarah, where are you? Do we have Sarah? Please turn on your microphone. Hi. Can't hear you. You can't. I'm now we can. Hi, I'm Sarah. Okay. Hi, how are you? Um, thank you for meeting with us. So my question was, how do you think COVID-19 coverage and the misinformation spread from Fox News, which was reinforced by President Trump, will affect the 2020 election? Hmm. Well, that is a great question. And, um, and it's a very, very astute question. I mean, I think that it is likely to have, uh, I mean, not just the misinformation, but the reality that the misinformation has fed, I think will um, affect the 2020 election. I mean, we know that people are not giving the president good grades on his handling of the pandemic, and I don't know how they possibly could. Um, I don't think, I don't see any much evidence, if any, that he's sort of changing his stripes on it. So if things continue the way they are now, um, I mean, there are a lot of Americans who are very upset about the way things have happened in their cities and their communities. And um, a lot of them do put the blame and the responsibility at the president's doorstep, which is, reasonable, certainly up to a point. Um, so yes, I think that it's, you know, he knows and the pollsters know and the Republican Party knows that November could be a really tough time for them. Katie Naum has a question that sort of dovetails right into that. Katie? Uh, yes, can you join us? Hi, can you hear me now? 
Okay, great. Um, so my question is what needs to change election coverage in 2020, given both what we learned in 2016 and the state of the US under the pandemic? So you were a little bit spotty, so I want to make sure I, I uh, understand what needs to change in the election coverage compared to 2016. And given the pandemic, yes, just everything okay. that we've, we've learned. Yeah, thank you. Right. Um, well, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, well, I think that there were a lot of mistakes made in the coverage, um, in the political coverage leading up to the 2016 election. Um, I actually just wrote a big column about it, so it's fresh in my mind. But, you know, one of the things was that um, the press in general has allowed President Trump, or at that time, candidate Trump, to kind of control the narrative and control what the media was writing about, sort of treating him as, or as if he were their assignment editor. So when he says something outrageous or something newsworthy, um, you know, it gets all this attention. I mean, the other thing that I'm sure you remember from 2016, which we can look back on uh, overall in shame, was the overstating of the Hillary Clinton email scandal, if you want to call it a scandal, um, especially compared to everything that, that Trump was, um, had been in his background. And while that did get some attention, I, in fact, I always like to um, remind people that the Washington Post, two reporters at the Post actually published a book in August of 2016 called Trump Revealed, which really was very, very informative. But, you know, meanwhile, the conversation politically and on front pages and home pages and, you know, your news alerts was a lot about Jim Comey bringing up the Hillary Clinton email stuff and reopening the investigation and all of that. So I think you know, bringing it back to the pandemic and the coverage there, I think that we should, you know, overall as members of the traditional media, we should be focused as intently as possible on what serves the public best. Not what the sort of sexiest story is, not what the most exciting scoop of the day is or how the president is insulting somebody today, but what actually serves the public, the public health, and, um, and public welfare best and kind of keep our eyes on that prize a little bit more or a lot more than we did in 2016. Um, Nicholas Rolater, um, you had a very good question. Would you join us? Thank you again for the conversation here. I, I guess, what, what do you think is the key catalyst that has allowed an alternative facts network to develop around the pandemic is clearly gr grounded in science? So, I mean, I, I, you know, it's probably not just one thing, but I do think that, um, you know, and this is painting with a broad brush, but I nevertheless think it's true. I think that the, that social media and the way Facebook and other social media outlets have, you know, sort of failed to control this in any way um, has been a huge factor. So, you know, just within the past couple of days, there was yet another, you know, video that circulated about hydrochloroquine. And, and it got some astonishing number of, um, of views and engagement on Facebook before they finally took it down. Um, meanwhile, you know, Twitter did a little bit better job with it and they quickly you know, labeled it and it was Donald Trump Jr. who had circulated it and they actually kept him off. You know, there was like a penalty to pay, which was keeping him off Twitter for a, a number of hours or a half a day or something like that, um, which, you know, obviously that's must be a terrible um, price, I guess. But uh, anyway, I, I think that if I were to give one, um, one answer to that, it would be the way misinformation spreads on social media in a way that you can never, you can never sort of put the toothpaste back in the tube. It's out there. It's, it's spreading. People are sharing it. They're talking about it. And, you know, I don't know how, you know, traditional media, I don't know how the front page of the New York Times can possibly compete with that. Um, 
is is it just that the public uh, or segments of it just don't want to know what is going on? Um, I, I had an incident in a public transport bus earlier in the week where somebody wasn't wearing a mask and I, I or certainly not properly and I asked them to do so and this person started screaming at me scamdemic scamdemic well what was she missing um, there are a lot of people like that um, does she not want to live? Does she not want to uh, have her family live? Does she not want this to end? Um, and yet, a phrase like that was was very key to her her understanding. Right. Well, I mean, there, you know, it's become very politicized, and I think if your tribe has chosen to downplay the pandemic and to say that it's a creation of the leftist, you know, extreme leftists, that maybe, you know, you're probably listening to listening to talk radio, you're probably on a Facebook page with people um, who agree with you who are posting outrageous and false things. And until it hits you or hits your family, I guess you can continue believing that. Um, I mean, it's very counterintuitive. Most of us would like to live and would like our families to remain healthy. But um, it is so politicized that I think that's, that's the reason. I so mean, if, if, you were able to, if you had been able to ask that person, what's, what are your sources of news and information? And if they had been able to answer you honestly, um, I don't think that it would have been, I mean, I'm not sure where you are, but if you're in New York, yeah. You know, I don't think it would have been like the website called The City, which is a really cool, you know, startup uh, digital site or, you know, or the or the New York Times or Newsday on Long Island. I think it probably would have been talk radio, Facebook and Fox News. Betcha. Yeah, clearly. Well, um Maybe the story that has to be done is that people need to interview the people who went to the Chelsea rally um, without masks and find out what the state of their health is today. I haven't seen that story anywhere. I'd like to see it. Um, in any case, uh, let, let's hear from Jasmine Vajani, who is the TA for the class, but she's also in a part-time producer at New York Magazine, and she is the head of the union at New York Magazine, or a member anyway, I'm sorry. Um, uh, and you have a question on unionization and reporters. I do. Um, hi, can you guys hear me? Sorry. Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, as, a, as a union member of a media company, um, what do you think media unions should be prioritizing right now amid mass layoffs and furloughs um, and at a time where paradoxically we have the highest readership? Well, I mean, Not it's really hard to, to talk about. I mean, I am glad that many media organizations have unionized their newsrooms. It's, it is a form of protection for people who otherwise would you know, really have no recourse at all. And they may still not have much recourse against furloughs or getting laid off or having their pay cut or whatever it may be, but at least they have strength in numbers, which is, you know, as you know, what the, what unions are, are all about, collective bargaining and all that good stuff. Um, I mean, I think that right now they have to be very focused on the economics of these newsrooms. And as you know, at New York Magazine, um, even at places like BuzzFeed, which at one time people thought, you know, or Vox, people thought, oh, these places are, they're the ones that are going to make it, these, these digital sites that are the new media. Well, they have suffered too. And it's, there's no guarantee that whether you're uh, legacy media or newer media or, you know, in print or just online or whatever, um, the business model has really failed and the business model which has to do with advertising um, and and in the wake of the pandemic because it's really has caused this huge uh, economic downturn 
advertising has fallen away because of that. And that's the reason that so many news organizations are hurting right now. So um, I see unionization as in general, a positive thing. And I think um, focusing on protecting staff against um, any kind of capricious moves that would hurt their livelihood is probably the most important thing. I mean, and as you know, another really important thing that's come up in recent weeks and months in the wake of the George Floyd killing in Minneapolis is the focus on race, diversity, inclusion. And that I think is extremely positive too. In fact, I'm so happy because one of my colleagues at the Washington Post was just named the first uh, black woman to be a managing editor at the Washington Post today. And that is undoubtedly part of this whole movement. And um, it's great to see, and she's a great person. We, on that, we have a, another question from Sam Yeoman. And, and his question really dovetails into that. Uh, Sam, where are you? Hi. Um, yeah, do you believe government subsidized journalistic outlets uh, would still be viable, would still be a viable option uh, to keep newspapers alive regardless of the administration that's in power? Well, it's a really tough question and it's a very, very good question. It's something that you know, I am struggling with trying to sort of decide whether I even think it's a good idea um, because the most important thing, media organizations or the press, if you want to put it that way, the most important thing we have is our independence. And um, with government funding, if there were ever to be direct government funding, I think that you know, it's very troubling to think about the kind of pressures that could come to bear if you want to keep that money coming in. Um, I mean, if you're at all familiar with what's happened at Voice of America, um, you know, the, the sort of the journalists, the journalists who've been there a long time, who are really good people, have basically, the leaders have left. And it's because there's a new political appointee there and so if that were to happen more broadly, that would be really troubling. And at the same time, we wanna keep these places in business and desperate times call for desperate measures. So it's a tough one. I think there could be some safeguards built in that might make it um, an acceptable thing to do. Um, Benjamin uh, Ramchar Rittar, uh, Benjamin won. Um, could you read your question about Fox? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Sure. Um, and my question is, uh, how is Chris Wallace's July 19th interview on Fox, where he fact-checked Trump uh, making things worse? How is it making things worse? Why do you think yeah. it's making things no, worse? No, no, it's a very good question. I wrote a column that said it might be making things exactly. worse. Exactly, uh, no, that's I exactly think Benjamin right. Is, I think Benjamin has done his research. Um, the reason I think it could be making things worse is that while it was a very good interview and it was great that to see him take a tough stance with Trump and fact check him in real time and be um, somewhat, um, you know, be skeptical and even um, contradictory of what the president was saying, it kind of gives, it acts as sort of a fig leaf for Fox News so they can say, oh, we're actually not all that biased because see, we have Chris Wallace. But then when everything else is in the other direction, I think it's very misleading. And they do, their public relations and their top brass do use that to say, oh, you're so wrong to say that we, you know, we're pro-Trump or we're part of, we're sort of state media or were a megaphone for the presidency. Um, because look, we've got Chris Wallace. So while I think it was a good interview, I think it can be a negative force in, uh, in another way. The other Benjamin, Benjamin Hogan, has a question about social media. Benjamin? Thank you, yeah, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, thank you. This has come up a couple times. You mentioned the business model as it relates to advertising. The social media companies, by and large, don't think they're media companies. They're just platforms, and they can kind of put out whatever they want. They don't have to fact check. I was curious, given your experience as the ombudsman for the New York Times, is it 
is the time that we require them to either employ an ombudsman or maybe it's thousands of fact checkers so that all the news that comes via Facebook is is accurate. Yeah, I mean, the problem with, yes, I, I do think they need to change their ways. The question is, how do you do it? Because Facebook right now has 2.6 billion users. So, you know, it's sort of like, how do you even get a hold of that? Um, it's really tough. And, you know, as we were talking about before, even when something is identified as being harmful, false, and, you know, potentially, um, you know, harmful to people's health, by the time they act on it, it, it it's already out there. Um, but I do think that Facebook particularly, because it's so dominant, needs to, um, you know, I mean, it's time to regulate them in a way that they've resisted and successfully resisted up until this point by kind of giving lip service to, oh, we have fact checking now, or we're really careful, we wanna serve our community, as they always say. And um, I mean, it's, it's, it's long past time to take a more serious stance on that. And I don't think it amounts to censorship, you know, at all. I think it's just responsible um, behavior. And I agree with you that these platforms really are media companies and need to kind of cop to the fact that they are and start acting like it. Arisa Lark, uh, you have a question about industry-backed research and how good it is. Um, yeah. So Awesome. Thank you so much for uh, speaking with us tonight. Um, yeah, my uh, question is about industry backed research. Um, and in a recent example, I was looking into how the plastics industry sort of seized on the opportunity to claim the dangers of reusable containers and to argue um, the reversal of plastic bag bans. Um, one of the ways they did this was through um, the dispersal of op eds um, in municipalities where plastic bag bans were set to take effect. Um, however, a lot of their arguments were backed by corporate industry backed research. Um, so I'm curious what kind of journalistic checks and balances exist to review and, ver and verify um, this kind of science, so to speak, um, that right. appears in these op-eds especially. Right, science or, or I guess faux science. Um, well, I think the most important thing that can happen in that situation is disclosure and transparency. So if you're gonna have an op-ed written by someone who is accepting um, you know, industry money or is somehow associated with the board of a big industry or you know, whatever it may be, that has to be disclosed. I mean, maybe that piece shouldn't run at all. And I would be probably more in favor of that. But if, if an organization is going to publish it, they need to tell us who, you know, who this person is and what their conflicts of interest are. And, you know, you know, one of the things that's happening as news organizations get, they lose, they're losing their staff. And so they're looking for ways to kind of beef up their content. And one of the ways they're beefing up their content is by taking stuff that they wouldn't have taken earlier, just to sort of have more, more material and more content. So that's a bad development, but I think it can be addressed in some ways by having really strong transparency and disclosure, but not every news organization does that. It's fascinating watching uh, some of the issues that have come up with the impeachment, how many of the lobbyists and, and those related to Trump and various uh, countries uh, were writing op-eds from um, uh, that were getting accepted. Uh, uh, on issues that they um, were clearly partisan on, and you know, op-ed should be partisan, but maybe not sponsored op-eds. That's right. a different question. Yes, I mean that's, and you know, news organizations need to really be very careful about that, and more careful than they have been. The source, you know, always the expression is consider the source. And with op-eds, which can be so persuasive, um, you really do have to not only consider the source, but disclose the source. So are, are journalistic outlets being, uh, what steps are they taking to be more careful? I mean, the good ones are being more careful and, and are being um, called to account when they aren't careful. And the ones that, you know, 
that don't have very strong rules on that, you know, will will continue to, you know, feed the beast. And and that's that's a bad thing. I mean, I do think that when news organizations like the Times or the Post had ombudsmen or public editors, that was, I mean, I wrote about that when I was public editor at the Times about disclosure in op-ed pieces. So, you know, it was one of many subjects, but at least I was able to kind of hold their feet to the fire. Uh, they don't well, have that, they don't have that anymore. <laughs> But there are many who miss it. Uh, in any case, um, I, I wanted to ask Joaquin Rosas to to come in and ask his question. Joaquin is our, is a sustainability student originally from Chile. Yeah, thank you, Claudia, and thank you for your time, Margaret. Um, my question was: How has the COVID nineteen pandemic impacted the current crisis in local news and its way to journalism? Well, that's a very pointed and good question. I, it has been disastrous for local news. Um, you know, local news was already in so much trouble before the pandemic hit. I mean, I would go so far as to say that it was in free fall. Um, since 2004, um, not only have 2000 newspapers gone out of business, but local newsrooms or American newsrooms were down by 45% in terms of their employment. So that's reporters and editors. Um, since the, you know, since I guess February, so many more journalists have been laid off or furloughed. So many more news organizations have gone out of business. It's really taken a situation that was very, very bad and, you know, put it into overdrive. So, and that's, you know, just kind of popping back to the question we were talking about about government aid, like whether it's a good idea to take government subsidies. One of the things I worry about with that is, you know, if you really were going to build some important rules into that, it would take a lot of time and a lot of, you know, study and a lot of task forces. And meanwhile, the whole thing is falling off a cliff very fast. So um, that troubles me a lot. We have only a few minutes left, and there are people out there who've signed in who, who sent some questions. Uh, and one of them is Maya Kadrigarmar, who was a student in last spring's class. And she asks, hello, Maya, by the way, um, throughout the course of the pandemic, the public has received conflicting guidance from the scientific community and the government officials wear masks, she says, don't wear masks, open restaurants, close restaurants. Um, how do reporters navigate this conflict, she asks? Well, there certainly has been a lot of conflicting information and, you know, the, the, the misinformation and the sort of wishy-washiness about masks really drove me crazy because you know, there was very good evidence from around the world yeah. that they really were serving a very important purpose. Um, I think that by paying less attention to the statements of politicians, even at the highest level, and more attention to worldwide experts, um, that could have gotten us a little bit closer to to the truth on these things and, and uh, a better outcome. Um, I mean, always I think expertise, scientific knowledge um, has to be placed at a higher level than political statements, which are so, um, you know, which are often done out of political expediency by, by definition. So um, a prospective student to Columbia named Julia Musto asked, do you think the limitations, restrictions surrounding access to ICUs and critical care facilities in the middle of this crisis have narrowed the scope of how coronavirus stories are reported? And do you think that this has hurt the public perception of the crisis? Um, she finally asked, how far is too far to get a story when your life could be endangered by an invisible enemy? And of course, what she's talking about is the reporters who've gone in with their cell phones and really risked their lives as much as battlefront reporters have. And we're all grateful to them. 
those seem like very two very different questions to yeah. me. Um, I, I guess if the if the first question has to do with whether the reporting about ICU availability was was overstated, is that is that the gist? No, I I think she's. She's asking whether not being able to get into the ICUs, uh, not being oh, able yeah. to report yes. has affected the entire discussion. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I think, you know, what journalists always want to do is we want to show people. We don't want to just tell or repeat things people are saying to us. We want to actually be there and be able to show the footage, you know, talk from our own observation. And when that is as limited as it has been, I think it really affects the quality of the information. Now, nevertheless, I think we've, you know, gotten inside some emergency rooms and we've seen the hallways filled with, you know, medical staff and people coming and going, but those were pretty controlled environments and not the ideal way to do journalism. Um, so I bet they went with a hospital PR person oh, at absolutely. their side. Absolutely. And of course, that makes sense because they needed to have protective gear and all of that. But I think it probably kept them in some ways from seeing some of the worst things that were happening and from being able to really tell it like it was. I mean, nevertheless, it's been pretty impressive to see the amount of good reporting that's gone on despite these hardships. And I would also say, you know, in terms of local news reporters, I've seen some great reporting by, you know, regional newspapers and, and other outlets that I'm really touched and impressed by. And yeah. somehow I feel like reporters manage to do their jobs, even under really difficult circumstances. You know, I've read so much about, well, I'm doing this story right now and it's really hard. And next week I'm being furloughed for two weeks. So I'll see you in, you know, July. I mean, those are really tough circumstances to, to do your job in when your pay is being cut and your job is in jeopardy. So um, a faculty member whose name uh, is Kanemoshi, I believe, he asks, uh, or she asks, a very general question, but it's a, it's a strong one. What are the problems faced by the reporter during COVID? 19. So I think access certainly is is one, um, you know, being able to get in there and, and, to, you know, the fear of being unsafe. Um, you know, we're all being, I hope, all being very careful. Um, I live most of the time in New York City. And wow, I, I was really, really confined to home and rarely went out. When I think of people going into hospitals, you know, and COVID wards, basically, that I find that to be um, actually heroic work. So I think access is a problem. I think the confusion about what different politicians are saying and the sort of the political crossfire is a very difficult thing to navigate. And just, you know, I mean, in society, generally, we're in a really tough time. And I think reporters have a kind of a exaggerated um, you know, an, an exaggerated version of that that makes it even more difficult. Yes, the, the frontline workers and the reporters who go into the hospitals, they're true heroes of the time. There's, there's no minimizing that. Shelley Freerman, who was a guest, she asks, how has the personal conversion in their own lives for reporters of the pandemic and the Black Lives Movement affected coverage of these once in a lifetime stories? Well, there's been a real um, confluence of these two huge stories, the pandemic, which has unfairly and unequally affected communities of color and poor communities um, and the George Floyd uh, killing and the protests that have followed I mean, they have come together at at a point which is about which is about how how unequal our society really is, and you know I don't think that's going away. And the more we can bring that home to people, um, the better off we are. I'll give one example of a of a local news story I admired recently from the Miami Herald. The Herald 
did a story about the poorest zip code in the Miami area, so the greater Miami area, and how COVID-19 was affecting that particular community. So it was a way of kind of drilling down in a very specific way that was both appealing as a story because it, was, it wasn't just sort of, oh, poor people have it tougher, which is absolutely true, but very, very specific. Um, and a great piece of local reporting that, you know, if the Miami Herald goes out of business, you're probably not going to see that story or a million others like it. Not to mention the Jeffrey Epstein story that they stayed with when, when no one else remembered. Uh, Nafisa Seyfedinova wants to give us a closing question. She asks, how will the world get through this? I think that might be uh, uh, out of my area of expertise. <laughs> I mean, I don't know the answer to that. I, I hope and trust that there will be a vaccine and therapeutics that eventually will, you know, help us uh, and help society. But I think we will be always affected by it and perhaps living with the effects and the results of it for a long, long time, maybe forever. And those of us who have lost family members or friends or whose family members or friends are chronically ill now are going to find that there is no end to this story. Yes, and on that, I'd like to close by remembering my friend Patricia Bosworth and her partner who, who died early in the pandemic and to a New York Times colleague who also died, uh, Alan Finder, and seven people in my circle. And I don't think my experience is unique. Everybody knows someone and not everyone knows how we can deal with this. In any case, thank you for shedding light on a difficult and ambivalent and su subject that there aren't clear answers to, but you help and, and we're all grateful for your work. Um, thank you to our guests out there. And uh, on Thursday, as again, and part of this class, we're going to have four science editors and a very great science reporter from the New York Times come and tell us about what they do and how they do it. This is an ongoing part of the School of Professional Studies and how we are trying to shed further light, as, as you do, Margaret, on the time we live in. Uh, thank you again. And uh, thank you. That, as, as they say these days, stay safe out there. Thank you very much for having me. And thanks to all the students for your great questions and your attention. I, I appreciate it very much.